Okay, great. Um, hopefully the tech will agree with us and we can, um, I've got some slides to show you. Um, and um, yeah, and hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Is the audio working? Okay, great. So um, what I'm gonna be talking about today is really one of my favorite topics, namely the history of the feminist movement of the late 1960s and 1970s. Um, during the, these years, um, as some of you will no doubt remember, feminist activists created arguably one of the most influential social movements in the history of the country. Um, they reformed older institutions, they created new institutions, um, they compelled both men and women within the society to reflect more deeply on relations between them and arguably created greater freedom for everyone. Um, but the movement also came up short in certain crucial ways. So what I really wanna do in my talk today is first outline what I understand to be some of the kind of core achievements of the feminist movement, but then turn to some of the defeats because in some ways I think the defeats are as revealing as the successes. But before doing that, I just wanted to give um, a little bit of a, a brief historical overview about how the groundwork for the feminism of the 1970s sort of started really a decade earlier. I mean, the feminist, the modern feminist movement goes back decades, but I wanted to sort of outline some of the things that are happening in the 1960s that helped set the stage for feminism. So between 1960 and 1965, policymakers began paying closer attention to the injustices that limited women's lives. And I think a big part of the impetus, and this is something we're gonna talk about a little bit later, was that in the post-war period, you had more and more women working for wages outside the home, um, either full-time or part-time. So in this context, in 1961, President John F. Kennedy created a new commission called the Commission on the Status of Women. And he asked um, former First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt, who you can see in this photograph, to lead the commission. And, and the commission drew on people from labor unions, uh, women's organizations that existed at the time and governmental agencies. And the task, the commission was tasked with really evaluating closely women's place in both the economy and the law. And what the commission found was really unsettling. It uncovered pervasive discrimination against women in employment, most notably unequal pay scales, um, as well as the absence of decent childcare options for mothers who worked outside the home. So the commission published its first report two years later in 1963, and that publication had three immediate um, effects. So the first thing that happened in the wake of this publication was President Kennedy issued an executive order requiring that all federal civil service hires um, for career positions be implemented without regard to sex. The second thing that happened in the wake of the commission report was that Congress passed something called the Equal Pay Act, which effectively made it illegal to set different pay rates for women and men um, who were doing the same work. And finally, the commission uh, decided to establish 50 sort of um, mini commissions in all of the states so that the work of investigating <clears throat> gender discrimination and sex discrimination could continue at the state level. So again, this is, I think, really important background to what we're going to see um, take off in the 1970s. Of course, uh, the year 1963 was also an important turning point because it was that year that Betty Friedan uh, published her best-selling book called The Feminine Mystique. Um, Friedan was a wife and mother and also a writer who in 1957 had gone back and attended her college reunion. It was her 15th reunion at Smith College where she began talking to other women who had graduated 15 years earlier that same year. And what she found in talking with these women was that they had received all of the benefits of higher education. They'd gone to college and um, often discovered sort of creative uh, talents, but then had kind of gone on to lead lives that had been largely confined to motherhood, marriage, 
and domestic life. And what Friedan found when she spoke with these women was that a lot of them expressed personal frustration. That is this idea that they had had ambitions, but those ambitions had been um, kind of curtailed um, later in life. And this was a problem that Friedan famously described as the problem that has no name. Um, so this was, I think, another important turning point. Um, another uh, shift the following year that is worth talking about was the passage of the Civil Rights Act that was passed by Congress in 1964. So this was a year after Friedan's publication of uh, The Feminine Mystique. And Title VII of the Civil Rights Act defined discrimination on the grounds of race, color, religion, sex, or national origin as an unlawful employment practice. Now, I think this is such an interesting story of um, Title VII because civil rights activists had been fighting for a really long time to secure the federal promise of fair employment uh, for African-Americans. So this had emerged out of the black freedom struggle. But what happened in the late in the mid 1960s rather was that activists who had begin began organizing around women's rights discovered that this um, Civil Rights Act and Title VII in particular could also be used by women as a really powerful tool for combating sexist discrimination as well. And the person who really grasped this and fought hard for this was the woman you see on the slide here, a woman by the name of Polly Murray. Um, Murray's a kind of incredible figure, someone who um, not everyone is familiar with, but Murray was an African-American Southern attorney who um, recognized that Title VII could be used to fight against both racial discrimination and sexist discrimination. And so the story behind this was that a congressman named Howard Smith, as the Congress was debating Title VII, um, actually argued that sex discrimination be included in the act and the theory is that he was doing this sort of to insert a, a poison pill into the act. The idea was that the idea was that um, including sex discrimination in Title VII would be so ridiculous that it would derail the bill entirely. But Polly Murray, when Smith did this, she saw her opening and she drafted a memorandum that she distributed to every single person in Congress. And in that memo, she wrote that, quote, if sex is not included, and you can read the quotes along with me, the civil rights bill would be including only half of the Negroes. The inclusion of sex was particularly important for African-American women, Murray continued, because those women especially needed protection against discrimination. And the reason she said was that um, African-American women headed their families um, often, like in about 20% um, of African-American families were headed by women. So um, what Murray argued here was that sex and race had to be included in the title to address the complexities and the challenges of African-American women's lives in particular. And Title VII did indeed pass. And this was really, really important turning point, um, not only in the civil rights movement, but in the women's movement, because First of all, it just acknowledged the simple reality that women were working outside the home uh, for wages. But the other thing that was so important about the Civil Rights Act is it created <clears throat> a new commission called the Equal Employment Opportunities Commission that would be a new federal agency where workers could go and they could file suit against employers who they believed were violating their right to fair treatment. Now, one of the things that's really interesting about this story is that when the EEOC first opened, the people who worked at the commission really didn't take women's complaints about workplace discrimination seriously at all. They sort of thought that sexism had been included in the law as almost a fluke. But um, by the late 1960s, um, so EEOC is founded in 1965, but by roughly 1968, the people who worked at the commission had done a complete 180 and were actually um, taking sex discrimination really seriously. And so the question for historians is like, what happened? How do you have this sort of huge shift in 
attitude, right? They at first are just like, this is completely ridiculous. We're not here to work on sex discrimination. And then three years later, they've completely changed their minds. And I think the answer has to do with real mobilization on the part of women's rights activists. So um, one really important moment in this came in 1966, where um, at the third national conference on the uh, commission on the status of women, um, women got together at this conference and they formulated a resolution that basically told people who worked at the EEOC, you know, you have to take the uh, problem of sex discrimination seriously. And this was the moment, it was at this conference that the National Organization for Women was founded. And of course, this is probably the most famous, well-established women's rights organization in the country. Um, who's by its own definition is committed to fighting for legal equality for all women. So the stated aim of now, again, I, I put the, um, the quote up there on the PowerPoint for you to read along with me is that quote, to take action to bring women into full participation in the mainstream of American society now, assuming all the privileges and responsibilities thereof in truly equal partnership. So what NOW was doing in 1966 in this fight for women's equality was saying, you know, women in the society no longer are working just as wives and as mothers. And there have to be changes in both law and public policy that um, are acknowledging that reality. In other words, public law policy and laws need to be sort of uh, brought into line with this new reality that the majority of women are working outside the home. And now was very, very powerful and it took off pretty quickly. It was founded in 1966 and by the following year, it had over a thousand members and it would continue to grow over the course of the late 1960s and into the 1970s. So by the early 1970s, you have a really rapid, I think kind of revolution in law and public policy that's being um, facilitated by women's rights. Between 1971 and 1974, Congress, I'll just kind of run through these pretty quickly, but Congress prohibited sex discrimination in things like medical training programs. It challenged gender discrimination in social security and other pension programs. It prohibited creditors from discriminating against women. And again, all of this is happening, I think, really, really rapidly. Um, in 1972, Title IX of the Educational Amendments Act banned sex discrimination in education. Basically, what Title IX did was it dis, uh, prohibited the dispersal of funds, funds from the federal government, to any educational institutions uh, that discriminated against women in college admissions or financial aid or notably athletics. So Title IX, of course, for anyone who's interested in the history of athletics, um, this is a really important um, turning point in uh, the history of women in athletics. Um, meanwhile, you had all sorts of fights going on in the courts because feminists were beginning to pursue legal cases. And of course, one of the ways that they did this was pursuing what are called industry-wide or class action lawsuits rather than individual cases. And so one of the most famous of these cases um, was um, a case that the EEOC brought um, against the phone company AT&T. In the early 1970s, AT&T was the single largest employer of women in the nation. I believe today that um, it's Walmart that plays that role, but at this time, AT&T was a really huge employer of women and it had very, very rigid um, sex discrimination. It barred women from jobs as linemen and operators. It classified all jobs according to sex and it denied women the same benefits and promotions as it gave to its male workers. So by 1970, um, roughly four years into the life of the EEOC, the commission had received over 1,500 complaints from women workers at AT&T. Put another way, this amounted to 7% of all the complaints received by the commission. I mean, this is like a huge 
a huge uh, percentage of the complaints that the EEOC is fielding is from this one company. A government report at the time contended that, quote, the Bell monolith is without doubt the largest oppressor of women workers in the United States. So in 1972, this suit against AT&T was settled out of court. Um, AT&T agreed to a multi-million dollar payment to women workers, and it also promised to implement a plan to end sex segregation in the company. So I think what's really interesting about this is, you know, these kinds of legal fights and all of these laws <clears throat> are not only kind of changing American workplaces and compelling employers to take sex discrimination seriously, but they also have a really profound effect on the psychology of women workers themselves. And I always share this quote with my students from a woman guard <clears throat> at a US steel plant who wrote, when I first took this job, I had to prove to them, meaning the men, that women could handle it. Before this, I had been brought up to think women were inferior and I believed it. It wasn't actually until I started doing what they considered a man's job and found out that I could do it just as well that I actually began to believe. And so there's a psychological revolution that's underway um, <clears throat> as well as these changes in the laws and the um, policies, like people are really changing how they think about themselves and their own capacities. So <clears throat> whenever I teach this feminist history, I'm always trying to stress to students both like how quickly these feminist victories were accruing between the mid 1960s and, and roughly 1980, and just also how widespread they were. And of course, um, the victories, these sort of steady victories were the result of a huge amount of work on the part of feminists and women's rights activists. But I think the other piece of this that's really interesting is that um, the gains that feminists were making during this time actually were consistent with certain fundamental changes in the US economy and the nature of work. Because by the late 20th century, you had more and more um, families in which both men and women would need to work for wages outside the home. And you also have this transition away from like um, heavy industries like oil and steel and the auto industry that had um, employed male breadwinners to new kinds of industries, service industry, information industries that are employing both men and women. So you have this really huge transition in the structure of the economy and the society um, in, in that um, the earlier model, say, of a male breadwinner going out and earning enough wages to support a wife and family uh, and children was being replaced by one in which most families would now require two full-time workers to sustain a household. And of course, that reality had always been true for working class families, immigrant families, minority families. But by the late 20th century, it's uh, true for more and more um, people. So again, um, the thing that always strikes me about this is that a lot of the achievements that feminism was securing during this period were really compatible with that change in the American workplace. In other words, the workplace, workplaces like AT&T had to kind of catch up with the new reality in which women, worker, women working for wages, um, women on the job was increasingly becoming the rule rather than the exception. Um, and so in that arena, in terms of fighting for workplace equality, um, feminism proved very, very effective. But in other arenas, um, feminism came up short. And I want to turn to that now in the second half of the talk, because I think, again, as I said at the outset, the feminist losses and defeats are as kind of significant as the wins. Um, because as feminists were making all of these inroads in terms of making workplaces more equitable, a whole other set of questions remained unanswered, specifically about what we might call care work or domestic work. So um, if both men and women are now working for wages outside of the home, who's going to take care of children? Who's going to take care of sick people? Who's going to take care of family elders? 
how would housework be divided between men and women now that both were working for wages outside the home, right? Who does all the laundry? Who does the cooking? Who does the meal planning? Uh, who does the cleaning? These are really crucial questions. And even though feminists early on attempted to answer them, um, they really remained unresolved into the late 1970s and 1980s, even as the society underwent really fundamental shift in how it thought about gender roles. And the result of this um, was actually a sociologist named Arlie Hochschild. You can see her name on the uh, book cover I have on the PowerPoint here. Um, she's a very famous sociologist who came up with this idea of the second shift namely that, uh, uh, that many American women essentially were working two full-time jobs. They'd go out to work, they'd work in the workplace, and then they'd come home and still do the lion's share of the housework and the childcare and the cleaning. Now, research has shown that um, there has been a shift in terms of a more equitable or equal division of labor between men and women. Men today do do more childcare than men of an earlier generation. They do do more housework, but at the same time, um, the research is also clear that women are still shouldering the burden disproportionately. The responsibilities are still falling on uh, women to sort of do this juggling act. And I think the visual on the cover of the Hoschild book captures the dynamic really well, right? That women are sort of doing this hat trick all the time where they're juggling all of these different things. So I wanna just look at kind of one, one particularly illustrative example of this problem, which is the question of childcare. Um, so the fight for free and affordable childcare had long been a woman's rights issue. In fact, as early as the 1940s, women activists in the labor movement were fighting for better childcare and more reliable childcare for women workers, um, especially of course, during World War II, when you had the iconic sort of Rosie the Riveter of women going out to work to support uh, the, um, the, uh, the nation. Um, but this question about childcare did not get answered. And by the 1960s, it was becoming more and more urgent as more women were entering the workforce. So in 1961, the New Dealer, uh, a New Dealer named Carolyn Ware lamented, appeared before the Commission on the Status of Women that I spoke of a little earlier and said that, quote, many of the most conscientious and responsible mothers cannot adequately take care of their children because they do not have the facilities which the community should provide for that purpose. So really very early on, um, women are raising, women activists are raising this question about childcare and saying this is really, really important. Five years later in 1966, when NOW was founded, it stated, the organization stated in its founding statement of purpose, that the challenge of balancing work with child wearing was not something to be shouldered by individual women, uh, but was rather a basic social dilemma which society must solve. So between roughly 1966 and 1971, women's rights activists worked really hard to advocate for some sort of national affordable child care plan. And in 1971, the US Congress passed such a plan. It was called the Comprehensive Child Development Act. And this act, if it had been implemented, would have created a national daycare program or system that would have been available to all parents on a sliding scale. So parents would have essentially been able to uh, pay what they could afford. So Congress passed this act in 1971. And Nixon, whom you see here um, on, the, on the PowerPoint, vetoed the act on the grounds that it would commit, quote, the vast moral authority of the national government to the site of communal approaches to child rearing, and that this communal approach would be over a, quote unquote, family-centered approach. Now, it was Nixon's special assistant, Patrick Buchanan, whom you see here talking to Nixon um, in the photograph, who advised Nixon, you know, Nixon could have vetoed this act on a lot of different grounds. He could have said, oh, it's just too expensive. It's too costly. But Buchanan urged him to really go um, 
hard against the act on ideological grounds. That is basically making the argument that some kind of universal childcare program was um, anti-American, that it was collectivist, that it was communal. Um, and so really trying to say that there was something sort of fundamentally un-American about this. And I think, you know, I mean, what's really interesting about the act in retrospect is that I think it did have the potential to really reimagine uh, the relationship between the family and children and the state, which was what so many women's rights activists were saying was sort of necessary at the time. Like there has to be a social solution to this problem, right? But I think what's interesting also is that Nixon was not alone when he condemned the act on the grounds that it was sort of communalist or too collective. Both the White House and the Senate at the time were inundated with very angry letters of opposition, um, many from mothers actually, who as I'll be talking about in a moment, were becoming politically mobilized as grassroots activists on the political right. Again, I'll, I'll be returning to that in just a moment. But you had a lot of rhetoric during this time that um, really actually drew on the earlier Cold War. So one conservative journalist named James Kilt Kilpatrick warned that the act would, quote, Sovietize our youth. A representative from Louisiana described the act as a power grab over our youth, as reminiscent of the Nazi youth movement. In fact, he continued, it goes far beyond Hitler's wildest dreams or the most outlandish of communist plans. I think this is so, so interesting because by the early 1970s, uh, the United States and the Soviet Union were in a formal state of detente, that is relations between them had sort of softened compared to earlier periods. But these statements are really evoking um, rhetoric that's drawn from the earlier Cold War period of the late 1940s and 1950s, especially this sort of um, confusion or collapsing of the Nazi regime and the Soviet regime. One Republican congressman even went so far as to describe a national child care proposal as nothing more than a plot on the part of psychologists to create a giant laboratory that would tinker with children's minds, right? This idea that you're getting all these babies and young children together to be kind of experimented on. So let's pause for a moment and look. So the Child Development Act went down in defeat. And it's not to say that after this, feminists and women's rights activists didn't keep fighting for some kind of child care. Um, but it's been really incremental and um, feminists haven't really succeeded around this is issue. So the question is why? Why did feminists lose this, this fight over childcare? And I just wanna, um, before kind of bringing things to a close and opening it up for questions, I wanna just propose a few of the reasons why. The first is that by the mid 1970s, feminists were facing a well-organized uh, counter movement comprised of grassroots activists uh, um, on what would come to be called the new right. And um, at the center of the politics of the new right was a championing of what it called traditional family values. And it's worth pausing to just note how tactically brilliant this was. New right leaders like Phyllis Schlafly, probably being the most famous whom you see here on the PowerPoint, who by the way, was the um, subject of a dramatized mini series on Hulu um, last year called Mrs. America. I don't know if anyone had the chance to see this starring Kate Blanchett, but if you're interested in this history, I recommend it. I think Hulu did a really good job with this. Um, but um, Schlafly was probably the most famous and visible champion of uh, this sort of traditional family values politics. And I obviously, um, I have a lot of criticisms of Schlafly's position, but she wasn't exactly wrong to be worried about the fate of the family in this new kind of economic world that I was describing earlier, because underlying this sort of championing of traditional family values were these same questions I was asking earlier. You know, who does the housework? Who cares for the children and the, and the elderly? Um, I think figures like Schlafly grasp that these were really important questions that needed to be taken seriously. Again, I don't, um, the answers she came up with are not ones that I agree with, but I think part of her political power was sort of honing in on these kind of very fundamental questions. So that's the first 
answer, right? You have this new right opposition um, that's taking shape by the late 1970s. The second thing I would stress, and I've already alluded to this, is the it really the defeat of a national child care program really speaks to the power of anti-communism well into the 1970s. Of course, by the 1970s, the most virulent forms of anti-communism had diminished, um, largely because of the social and cultural upheavals of the late 1960s. Um, but you just see, as I mentioned earlier, the revival of this really intense Cold War rhetoric that critics are using to condemn the Comprehensive um, Child Development Act. Again, critics could have just straightforwardly said, this is too expensive, we can't afford this. But that's not what they did. They really um, argued that a national child care program was an fundamentally anti-American. And I think that's interesting to think about. Um, in the context of the 1970s, because this was a period when all sort all different forms of collectivism, whether you were talking about strong labor unions or greater social spending, all of these things were coming under greater attack. But the third thing I think is that the childcare defeat, I think, captures certain blind spots within the feminist, feminist movement itself, because by the late 1970s and the 1980s, the movement really came to focus exclusively on the problems of inequality within the American workplace. And at one level, that focus was deeply understandable because there was so much discrimination on the job, um, not simply at the levels of law and public policy, but also at the levels of culture and changing people's psychologies. And I mean, and I think that there's still a lot of work that remains to be done um, as we've seen in the last several years with the rise of the Me Too movement and recent allegations about sexual harassment. We still have a lot of work to do when it comes to, um, you know, ensuring equality on in the workplace. But I would argue that the exclusive attention to the issue of workplace equality also cost the movement a lot. And um, one um, historian who's influenced my thinking on this is a woman named Lane Windham, who has written about the history of a group called Nine to Five, which was a Boston-based group that um, advocated for women office workers. And as that group was forming, there were some members who said, you know, we really need to include childcare as a demand. Um, and the leadership refused to do that. And um, that cost them members and especially African-American women members whose long history in the workplace made them especially aware of these dilemmas that confronted working mothers when it came to simultaneously working outside the home and caring for their own, um, their own children. And what Wyndham writes is that nine to five's founders rejected um, the demand for childcare because they didn't think they could win it. They thought it was a losing issue. Um, and at some level, I understand that decision because if you've ever been involved in any sort of political activism or any kind of organizing, you know that you have to set priorities, right? You can't fight every fight. You've got you've to make certain decisions. But it's also arguable that social movements lose something when they only choose to fight the fights that they're convinced they can win, right? That sometimes you can fight a fight and lose, but you can also create alliances uh, that are really, really important in terms of the overall uh, vitality of a movement over time. And again, this isn't to say that like feminists completely abandoned the issue of childcare altogether. So, um, in 1977, the president of now at that time, a woman named Karen DeCrow said, quote, homemaking is work and the fact that it's not salary must not keep us from moving towards benefits enjoyed by other workers, social security, pensions, unemployment benefits, and health insurance. If you went to a feminist rally in the late 1970s or in the 1980s, you would see women carrying signs at marches that read things like this, what you see on this button, every mother is a working mother. And yet researchers have found that um, feminists by the late uh, 1970s and into the 1980s really were relying um, more and more on legal strategies that were centered again on this question of workplace discrimination and weren't sort of dealing with these issues of what it meant um, 
what was actually happening within the home. Um, and for their part, you know, I think working class women and poor women, it wasn't that they didn't support the goal of workplace equality, um, but they recognized that an exclusive focus on workplace equality wasn't enough. And so in some ways, the childcare issue became offloaded onto working class women. And um, as one childcare activist uh, said, and this is my uh, final quote here, uh, uh, this was a childcare activist in California who recalled of the feminist she met while trying to bridge feminist activism and childcare activism in the 1970s. She said, I was the childcare person. If I brought an issue, they'd pass it. They trusted me. They were supportive of it. But in general, at least in San Francisco, they tried to break through the glass ceiling in professorships and law offices and affirmative action in businesses, in government jobs. Most of them, many of them did not have children and it wasn't a gut issue for them in the same way. Many of them frankly were educated, not working class, not poor women. So I think this is really interesting thing to think about um, in terms of you know, the, some of the class uh, tensions within the movement. But I think ultimately the feminist fight for childcare went down in defeat because it called for a, a redistributive program that would have really fundamentally reshaped how we think about American uh, citizenship and the nation. So an economist named Nancy Fulbright wrote, and I think this is a really instructive quote, it's easier to sell rights. The rhetoric of rights for women is relatively cheap whereas the rhetoric of support for care work involves more redistribution. And so I think the fundamental point here is that, again, the fight for workplace equality went hand in hand with um, getting women into the workplace and this larger structural change that was underway, whereas care work was something, or childcare in this case, was something that would have required a really serious commitment of resources and money. Uh, and a, a real redistribution economically um, that um, that the, the political powers were not willing to do at that time. So let me just kind of conclude on a personal note here um, and say, you know, a lot of these issues that I've talked about today, we all kind of just got a really front row view of them um, during the pandemic um, because there were many, many stories, and this is drawn from just one I plucked off of uh, uh, Google, but there were many images like this, many stories like this um, about what it meant for so many working mothers to, final, to suddenly find themselves working from home with young children. Um, and um, you know, when the pandemic first hit in March of 2020, I went on Twitter for information and camaraderie and I follow a lot of fellow academics on Twitter and it was so interesting to see the differences, not so much between men and women, but between academics with children and academics who didn't have children, because the academics who didn't have children, I mean, they were of course alarmed about COVID and the whole situation, but they also were like predicting that they were gonna have all this time to do their research. Whereas those of us with parents who have children were just like, basically we're totally screwed. Like we're not, we're not gonna get any work done uh, of our own. Um, and I was one of the lucky ones. Like I was able to transition to working from home. My children are older at the time of the pandemic. They were 12 and 17 and so fairly independent. But nonetheless, I found myself in a constant flow of shopping and cooking and cleaning and teaching. Um, and um, really a lot of other things that I wanted to do professionally got shunted to the sidelines, right? So I think the pandemic uh, has really torn away the curtain on a lot of these issues. And I think has really brought home the main point that feminists have been raising for a long time, which is that when you're juggling all of these things, you, it can often feel very personal and that the solutions have to be personal and individual, but that really this is part of a much larger social problem um, that has to be addressed sort of socially and politically, not individually. So um, that's my talk. I'm going to go out of this, the screen share. And um, I actually don't. Oh, it's 1045. Perfect. OK, great. So I'm happy to answer any questions or hear your thoughts and re reaction to the comments. And just a reminder to everybody, if you would unmute yourself when you have to make a comment, don't forget to do that. Uh, 
I have a question or a comment. Um, this issue is much broader than my mind normally encompasses. <laughs> and so um, my views, I suppose, are slanted. But if I were an employer, um, what the child care that, that you are saying the feminist advocate would translate to me in my own selfish perspective that if I have a single male or a single female and a, a mother applying for the same job, that the mother wants me to pay her a bonus that I could, won't be paying to the other people because she has children. And so just on the simplest level before considering the broader aspects, that doesn't seem particularly fair or appealing if I'm an employer. So I see what, to me, it's, it's sort of what you're saying is that it's a, it's a, a much broader issue, but to the individual, particularly individual employer, that's a losing proposition. Right. I, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. And secondly, um, I hadn't thought about it that much either, but the fact is that I believe um, the reason th that, the, that the communist countries, particularly Russia and China, um, had those big child care things is exactly that they wanted to destroy the family influence and to make people dependent on the state. So it's not without some rationale that people are concerned about how much that influence is going to be. Uh, yeah, I love this comment. I, I think these are both so interesting. And like, I really thank you for sort of bringing up this issue of like what this looks like from the point of view of the employer, because this was the long, like one of the longstanding issues was that, um, you know, um, in the, throughout much of the 20th century in the 1940s and 1950s, if a woman had a job and she got pregnant, she was just fired. Like that was it. Right. And I mean, you can certainly <clears throat> I totally understand the logic of what you're saying from an employer point of view, like if you have two candidates and you have one woman who's pregnant and one able-bodied man, like from the point of view of the boss, like, of course it's like, why would you hire someone who's going to have to stop working or go on maternity leave? Um, and, um, but I think one of the things that's interesting, like I always like thinking about these issues through comparisons and like, um, it shouldn't, it shouldn't necessarily, the burden shouldn't be on the employer either. So in Germany, for example, uh, the state has a really, really generous maternity leave. The state pays a woman like, or a man actually, either, either parent gets something like two to three years of paid parental leave that the German state gives to its citizens. And um, the and the business can hire someone else, and you know they they get their job back eventually or whatever. But it's the state that's shouldering the burden. In France, they have um, they have state uh, paid for childcare centers from really early on. So it's like Germany and France approach it from opposite ends of the spectrum. Germany has this really generous parental leave. France has national childcare that allows people to go back to work really quickly. But it's not the employer that's shouldering the burden for those things. I mean, I think that like we. Again, everything in the US is so privatized, like, because, for example, health insurance is something provided for so many people through employment, but there are other ways of imagining this. And then the second, oh, the second question was the one about collectivism. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think that that's a really interesting question, too. Like, um, and it's a, it's that this idea that, like, you know, China and Russia um, were, they were actually like some of the anti-communist rhetoric has elements of truth to it, I think is a really important and interesting point. And um, it's one that, you know, um, I think it's just a reminder to take our sources seriously. Um, I'm just struck as someone who studies the 1970s and has like looked at the history of detente, I'm just struck by the, the continuities between the rhetoric you see in the 1970s 
that I would have associated with like a much earlier period in the Cold War and how long it, it continues in, into the 1970s. But I think your points are really interesting for sure. Well, you know, also uh, we don't, uh, you know, employers pay social security for all workers. Doesn't matter whether you're male, female or what. Uh, there, you know, if there were, you know, a national support for childcare, uh, you know, it could be paid in somehow to the government for everybody. And then whoever does it takes advantage of it. And basically it's the family taking advantage of it, not a man or a woman. So I think there are a lot of ways to accomplish getting government support for childcare. Uh, a lot of other problems then with who, who determines where the money goes and who gets paid and you know, how do you oversee it and be sure that you don't wind up in the, you know, the big nursing home uh, problems that exist. So, I mean, there are other things that come along, but I, I think it, it, it could, could be done. I think there are, as, as you pointed out, there are more men being involved with childcare and child rearing and doing things at home now than, than probably ever before. But, uh, so I, I don't think it has to be man versus woman. I think it can be just for the family. I agree. And, and just to sort of build on that, like my closing anecdote about the kind of fretting I saw on social media, it wasn't primarily men versus women. It was parents versus non-parents, right. um, which I think shows a real shift in consciousness, you know, as well. I don't want to understand. I, I, I want to be clear. It's a, it's a, um, these questions affect men and women. And you have seen a, a real shift in consciousness um, where there is just much more uh, equal division of labor between men and women in the home around things like taking care of children and child rearing. Um, things have, have changed quite a bit. And yet like a lot of the journalism that came out during the pandemic was just like working moms are going crazy in, during the pandemic and like, it's too much. and. Um, and even in my case, as I said, my kids are older and they were relatively independent um, and could do homeschool or remote school pretty easily, but it was like a workstation. I mean, it was like you made one meal, you cleaned, had an hour and a half, and then it was time for the next meal. And it was just sort of this endless cycle. And my husband was around and he helped too, but it's a, it's a lot for sure. Natasha, I was struck by the fact that, that you really opened your lecture talking about uh, the burdens on women and particularly in the area of child care and really don't we have in the 3.5 million human infrastructure uh, proposal which is now being developed in congress the haven't we made extraordinary progress in getting a bill introduced in congress uh, that poses some solutions uh, by way of governmental benefits or funding to provide these these basic needs and perhaps rec in, in put it in the format of a social burden that everyone needs to contribute to. Great point. I Yeah, I mean, this is all extremely timely, right? Because I sort of, I agree. Um, the like just the, the stuff that I read about the child tax credit um, was incredible. And like, it was some statistic, like the child tax credit, if it were implemented permanently would lift 50% of children out of poverty or something. Um, and I think Biden is certainly, and I'd love to hear your all perspectives too. I mean, he's definitely, I think he's the most, um, he's the most unapologetically liberal president of my lifetime for sure, in terms of the things that he's proposing. And again, I think part of it is um, a response to the, the things that came into relief during the pandemic, but also, you know, um, that there is a sort of, it's, it, it's the way scholars describe it as a sort of systemic crisis in care in the society. It's not just childcare, it's elder care, it's caring for the sick. Um, that our, we're living at a time when um, the society is 
there's a kind of crisis in care because everyone is work, so many more people are working for wages and that leaves little time uh, for these other things. And then you have a division in the society where people with resources, they outsource all this work. So you put an older person in a, in a nursing home if, or a retirement community or whatever, um, or you pay for a nanny to come in and take care of your child while you go to work. People with resources have those options. A lot of other people don't, but I, I think you're a hundred percent right. Like the, the, the discussions that are going on with infrastructure are amazing. I've never seen a discussion like this in the country where people, you have people saying, you know, childcare is part of infrastructure. I mean, that's like, I've never heard people talking about it like that. So we're, we're yeah, it's a, it's a real opportunity. I mean, whether or not we're able to move the needle politically is another question, but. Well, I think a big part of <clears throat> what is going on here is the, we, we've had globalization and I think globalization, uh, perhaps you suggested it was uh, concurrent with uh the 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 two worker uh the two worker family i think it really very much has driven the two worker family because it globalization has resulted in the decline of unions the decline the loss of manufacturing jobs and the big movement to the service service industries and that has placed uh lower class and middle class workers in a position where they're uh, looking at uh, a much slower rise in economic benefits, but it is uh, greatly benefited uh, uh, the wealthy. And I think the Biden, Biden proposal is really a is in, is in part a wealth redistribution proposal to offset those uh, uh, changes resulting from globalization. I, I agree a hundred percent. I mean, that's exactly what I was sort of trying to allude to um, in the talk. I mean, I think the thing that's also important is that of course the period after World War II, roughly until the 1970s is uh, scholars describe it as the golden age of capitalism. You have an expanding middle-class, you have strong labor unions, you have rising productivity and rising mm -hmm. wages. Wages have stagnated since the 1970s for most people. That's why partly you have to have men and women working in so many families. Um, so um, yes, I agree completely with your reading of that. But how are you gonna persuade the haves to give it up? <laughs> you have to hit the mule over the head with a big <laughs> stick. Uh, Natasha, uh, I, uh, Natasha. I, if there's one is uh, has to do with uh, an article that I recently read in the New Yorker on the sex wars, feminism and its fault lines. Yes. You happen to have read this article by Ami Srinivasan, and uh, I had a tough time getting through the entire article, and I read it out loud to my wife, and we were puzzling through some of it. A note here in one, one paragraph, she says that today the most visible war with the Anglo-American feminism is over the place of trans women in the movement and in the category of women more broadly. Now, I understand this is not what your talk was focused on and the economics right. and all this, but there seems to be a very strong uh, movement in, amongst feminists in recognizing uh, women in this broader sense. And you mentioned Title IX and some of the controversies that have come about bathrooms and competing in athletic events. I just maybe thought I'd ask you if you have any thoughts uh, along any of this. Yeah, I did read that article. So fascinating. Um, her work is making a big splash right now. She's getting a lot of media attention. She's a philosopher based in Oxford. Um, this is such an interesting question. Like, so just for people who maybe this is sort of off uh, a little bit of what I was talking about, but um, in recent years, there's been growing attention to trans rights and uh, the category of trans um, identity, this whole discussion of gender fluidity and um, people transitioning, um, people born male transitioning to female, et cetera. In England, where this writer is based, there's a much more kind of pitched battle among feminists. There are some feminists. And I, I think actually the most famous public person who's been part of this is J.K. Rowling, the author of the Harry Potter books, who's what are called TERFs, who really reject this idea that, of trans identity. Um, I find the whole thing really interesting. So I have students, my students 
are, are super evolved on these issues, um, really just accept this. And they, like, I just had a student <clears throat> who was critiquing a book from, I don't know, that was talking about reproductive rights in the seventies or whatever. And was what, and she said, I didn't, I, my criticism of the book is that the author didn't acknowledge that like, not only women can get pregnant or, you know, it was like one of these things that's like all about the kind of drawing on this contemporary discussion of gender fluidity and all this. And I was like, but that's really presentist. Like back in the, it's not that there weren't trans people back in the seventies because there were, but at the same time, like all of the activism that I'm just, I described in my talk today does rely on this category of woman as a, or, and man. And like, as, and I'm relying on that binary because the activists at the time, it's a really, I mean, the question you're raising is so super fascinating, right? Because if you're blowing open the category of woman and you're saying there really is no such thing, or we have this gender fluid model now, I mean, politically, you sometimes have to use the identity of woman to fight for women's rights. If like women are still not making, you know, making only 70% on every dollar, like, I mean, this is sort of, I'm kind of babbling, but hopefully you're seeing me make the connection. Like, it's very hard to do certain kinds of politics if you don't rely on those fixed categories. And yet like the younger generation doesn't think about gender the way we did. I mean, sir, I mean, I have a 13 year old son and he just, it's like, on social media, like gender fluidity is just like, that's the norm now, <laughs> you know? So I have to kind of find my way through, um, kind of puzzle my way through these things um, too. So I, I mean, I, it's a really fascinating. I encourage people, the article is a little dense, but it's, it's really interesting. And I think these battles about identity and sexual and gender identity and where we're at with that are super fascinating. Um, Marsha, were you going to ask a question before? Yes, uh, not a question as much as when I graduated college in the 1950s, I didn't know one woman doctor nor one woman lawyer, except maybe Nina Miljanico, who was in Birmingham. But you either became a nurse, a teacher, a homemaker, or a bookkeeper. Those were the options that women had. And that's what most of the ones that I graduated with, that, that's what they became. So I think women have come a very long way because I understand in medical school and in, in law school, the majority of students are women. And so I think we've come a long way, baby. <laughs> I agree. And actually, like now there's a growing literature that like women, bo girls are just like in high school and stuff, they're just out outpacing the boys. Like now there's growing worry that the boys are falling behind academically um, in terms of just like grades and tests and stuff. But yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think the, the revolution, that's sort of what I was trying to stress in the first part of the talk about how revolutionary this was. And it's like really nice to talk to someone who remembers the time before because my students just don't, my students just don't get it. Like, I'm like, no, you, if you opened a newspaper, well, first of all, they're like, what's a newspaper? But like, <laughs> but like if you opened a hard copy of a newspaper in the 1950s or 1960s, like jobs were classified according to sex. Like there were postings for men and postings for women. And um, yeah, I think that there have been unbelievable, I mean, unbelievable revolutions in like areas like law and medicine, um, which is amazing and worth celebrating for sure. Um, Unfortunately, politically, it seems that, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the majority of our politicians continue to be uh, white old men. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that is really interesting, right? Like, it's it's interesting to think about why the US has yet to have a, a woman president. I mean, we lag behind so many other countries with that, but also representation in, in, in the quarters of power, for sure. I mean, it's a really fascinating question. Okay, any more There's questions? A lot, traditional. There's a lot of traditionalism in the United States. Uh, we are uh, 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 educated people, college graduates. Some of us are academics. Some of us are pro professionals in other ways. And 
uh, we don't see the small communities where education is not a primary uh, part of the life and uh, where traditional approaches uh, are, and old fashioned in some ways uh, continue to uh, exist. The anti-communist theme, the anti-socialist theme, for example, which is being, has been fought for since the beginning of the 20th century is still being fought even though uh, the communist system is pretty much gone by the board and totalitarianism is, is more of a, an issue. Uh, that's why you see uh, mostly men in those positions. It's also interesting to note that the boys have fallen behind and uh, women are taking greater places in professional societies and in the workplace. But one of the things to think about is the fact that women have had a tremendous amount of support and pressure from political groups, from support groups that have developed to help women uh, in the workplace and elsewhere. Men have, in the, I guess previously, have, have depended upon the old boy network, more or less, have not developed any kind of support systems. And we see that even in, at UAB, at least in the medical school, uh, women get tremendous amount of support. Women in, women in medicine, women in this, women in that. And men, you know, they're there, but uh, there's, no, there's, no, there's no real support system. And I think it's, it works against men, but clearly, uh, men have been successful where they have been successful. But I don't see that continuing unless there's some, some help along the way now in this new age. I, I mean, I think it's a really interesting point, right? Like <clears throat> if you're part of a, 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 if you're part of a group that's been marginalized, say like in the field of medicine, and there's a recognition that you have to remedy that, like you're, there are support, as you're saying, there are support systems put in place mentoring programs that are put in place um, to help if you're like a young female doctor, a young woman doctor, um, to help navigate that terrain. Um, whereas if you're part of the dominant group, there are structures in place that have been there that help that help that help to get you there just sort of institutionally, but you're not necessarily going to have that same sort of sense of like a cohort that needs to support each other or um, so I think this is a really interesting point you're raising, for sure. Uh, men also tend to be very competitive. Women are too, but women women support each other more than more than men do. I think Not they're, necessarily. They're, they're <laughs> I've had some pretty harsh female <laughs> authority figures in my career. It's not necessarily true. But if you I, I, I thought what you were going to say is that my my sense is. Um, well, this is, this is just very anecdotal, not historical. I mean, I think women have a, so I think in my own limited experience, I'm, I have a, a capacity to, for friendship and to enlist friends, whereas the men I know have, with other women, like I have very strong female friendships and that's very sustaining for me and all my, all my areas of my life, whereas um, men are a little shyer about leaning out on each other in terms of male friendships. I think men sometimes have a harder time with that, but that's a different conversation. Well, women, women tend to talk to each other. Men tend to talk at each other. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Mm. Marsha, you're muted if you're talking. Uh I want to thank you, Natasha, for a wonderful hour. <clears throat> really enjoyed it. And uh, thank you again for spending your morning with us. I loved it. It's great. I loved having the opportunity. And it's, it's really nice to um, meet all of you via Zoom. And I hope sometime we'll all be able to get back together in real life. And meanwhile, please stay safe and healthy. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy. Bye. Thank Thank you. Just really take care. Just a reminder, a reminder to everybody tomorrow, we have uh, Fred Hunter meteorologist from Channel 6. He's going to talk about Absolutely Alabama. Please join us. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.